Well, thank you all for coming. I know the mornings are busy, and you all are so busy, so I know what it means to spend two hours every day. Um, I am going to start with introductions. Even though I had a nice introduction, <laughs> I want to tell you a little bit about um, why I'm here. So I am from Brain Traffic, which is a content strategy consultancy, but there are a lot of other things that happened before that that I hope you'll find relevant. Um, who am I? I'm a do-gooder. My first job out of college was working at a park, um, at a park where um, most of the families didn't speak English. And then I went to the, uh, oh, I'm not dancing. Yeah. Okay. There we go. There we go. Then I moved over to the public library where I got paid a dollar a day. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I worked tirelessly at both of these jobs. I did not do it for the money. I um, had I had so many things in the world that I wanted to do. Uh, I ended up at Search Institute, which is a research organization um, that studies positive youth development. I, um, I was there for about eight years, and that's where I had my first brush with content strategy. I, um, my whole career path had all been in nonprofit. And um, one day, this person named Christina Halverson, who owns Brain Traffic, came and gave a talk at Search Institute. And she talked about setting priorities with content strategy. And I practically gave the woman a standing ovation because at Search Institute, we did a lot of things. And Lynette, who's here, um, we worked together so she can confirm that we did a lot of things. And it was hard to keep track of everything. There were, you know, when you're trying to do all these different things for all these different audiences and you have minimal resources and you're dependent on outside funding, um, things can get a little challenging. So um, I, also, I also now, I'm involved with um, my church's content strategy, which I'll talk about a little bit later with an example. So I've continued to keep up my nonprofit work more personally, but I work at Brain Traffic. And specifically, I work for um, CompFab Events, which is the conference side of Brain Traffic, because doing um, client work just wasn't enough um, doing good for me. So I had to move over to the educational side. And our conferences are um, we have four conferences and we bring t people together and we have some that are more general and some that are more niche, including one for nonprofits, which was, um, again, my, like, my effort to sort of merge my two worlds. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. I'm not really here to talk about the conference, but I wanted you to know that I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel your enthusiasm for the work that you do. Um, I know what it means to have work that's really close to your heart and I want to change the world. So, said a little bit about what I know about you. Um, I, I would love it if we could just take a couple quick minutes, if you can just tell me your name and the name of your nonprofit organization, um, or who you're representing if not a nonprofit. That's helpful to me to know who's in the room, so. Sure, I'm Kate, and I'm from Nonprofit Assistance Fund. I'm Amanda, I'm from the database. I'm Lynette, I'm from the Brain Traffic Jessica Zimmerman and I work at the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the Humphrey School. I'm Lee Chittenden, I also work at the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance. I'm Erin Heisler, I work at Children's Home Society and Social Service. Uh, Steve Blue, Asia Media Access. Sherry, I'm with Matt. Uh, Marcos, I'm with Underwriters. International Charitable Foundation. Hi, I'm Rhonda Siraj and I'm with Serious Sisters. Diana Schleisman, <coughs> People Group Store. Stars are presented. Okay, well, um, it sounds like we have a really nice breadth of um, missions, and, and that's great. That was exactly what I hoped. I know that some of you had submitted questions to Carrie before the talk, and I've, um, the questions were not, they're, they're sort of all over the map, so I've done my best to answer them here and there. 
um, and to weave in the answers to your questions. I will save lots of time at the end so that you can ask um, individual questions as well. Um, so the other thing I know about you, um, some of you have lots and lots and lots of content. You have too many pages on your site and you don't know what to do with all of it. Um, and some of you have lots of people who care about that content and they all have opinions and you're sort of waiting to get things from them. And then some of you, you're the only person. You're the only person doing the work at all. Um, and that's a really, really wide range of experiences. But what you have in common is that you all are here because you want to set smart priorities. So I'll try to give enough examples that are um, larger scale and smaller scale. And hopefully you can find yourself somewhere in, in the examples here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about why priorities are hard for nonprofits. I have worked, um, like I said, I've worked with nonprofits both as, a, as an in-house nonprofit worker and I've worked with um, several nonprofit clients. And then I've worked with um, for-profit clients. And I see some pretty unique struggles for nonprofits who are trying to do digital strategy. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean when I, when I say content strategy or content. Um, but I want to start off with what's, what's the challenge here? What's the, what makes you unique? Again, it's because you want to do good. And you have, um, you have all these hopes and aspirations and these good things that you want to do in the world. Um, but what that means is your work is never done. So if you're doing good, you would like to do more good. You want to be even better and help even more people or do even more things and do do uh, great things that help everybody. So there's surely an underserved population somewhere. Um, so this, this is the problem. You want to do everything. You want to, uh, and, and it's, we, and many of us want to do more than one everything. So, so you might work for one nonprofit and volunteer at another nonprofit. And what that means is it's very hard to set priorities. Um, often you're also dependent not only on um, the minimal resources that you may have within your organization, but sort of the, you might have the whims of funders. You might have um, the coming and going of volunteer work. So if you've got people creating um, digital content for you, maybe you have a social media property that someone was running as a volunteer and then that person disappears. So it's exceptionally hard for nonprofits to set priorities because you're not really working with the same rule book as for profit. And so I'm very excited to be here and um, try to help you do, uh, set your priorities so you can do the best good, the most good, and the goodest good <laughs> possible. So today what we'll talk, I, I'm going to do a little overview, just a really brief introduction to content strategy since I throw that word around. I won't talk about it in a lot of depth because I know a couple of you were here when I spoke a couple of years ago and I don't want to repeat myself too much. Um, but I will include some of the resources that people especially liked uh, that time. And then we'll talk about how you can use content strategy to set priorities. And I've got some tools. I gave you some handouts. And I have this tendency to talk really, really, really fast. So then I, like, I'll never get through 140 slides. But there's a good chance I will. So, <laughs> so I have some activities that we can do together to break up the time so that you're not listening to me talk for two hours. But I also, um, I have a couple of takeaways in there that we probably won't cover in a lot of depth, but hopefully you can take them back to the organizations and find them useful. So um, let's talk about content. I know you're here for uh, digital strategy, and, and I want to be really clear that I focus on the content side of digital strategy. If you are here because you are looking for um, design advice or technology advice, I know just enough to get me into trouble on both topics. But I really deal with content. Like what is the content of your, um, your website, your newsletters, your email campaigns, your social media properties? Um, so when people talk about content, they talk about different types of content. There's video content, there's text, there's um, you know, some, sometimes people use maps to show the work that they're doing. And I find it's really easier if you think about it the way you think about a book. If your organization were a book, what's the table of contents? Um, what is it? It's, it's why people come to you, why they come to you to read your things or learn about what you're doing or participate in what you're doing. So when you think about content, um, that's, it's sort of like what's, what are people looking for in the book? And 
most importantly, this is why they'll choose you over someone else. So if you're reading a good book, um, it's if you're if you're trying to pick the one that does what you need, it's like it's like oh well, I'm picking this one because it has what I need. And I think you know it's it's easy to think that way in terms of products or for profits, but nonprofits are the same thing. Why am I why am I helping you um, end hunger? Why am I helping you uh, clean up the water in this region? So so coming up with why somebody would choose you over someone else. Um, so the, the, the single most important thing you can do is create content that is valuable. And so when people come to your site, they're looking for an experience. And they're looking for information. So what is it that they will value? Not, not what do you value about yourself, but what will your reader value? What will your user value? And it's important to remember that when people are searching for online content or reading their email or scanning through social media posts, um, it's fast, it's busy, it's it's they're looking for they're looking for exactly what they need. And it's not like when we're, they're they're offline. You know, if you're offline and you're just reading a magazine or you're reading on your iPad, um, you know, if if we're, if we're talking about an ebook, that's a different experience than most online content. So the online offline thing doesn't totally work anymore, but the but the leisure reading versus the I need something reading. Um, so this is what you know. People are doing ten things. They are um, they're at, they're doing their work and they're answering their personal email and they're they've got all these things going on. So um, to stand out from all of that, you need to consider what's different about reading online. Um, there are short attention spans. People are impatient. They want what they came for. They um, they're they're ready to click somewhere else. They're ready to look at something else. So if there's that that Facebook feed with you know this story and that story and this you know which which stayed by the Bell character are you? I mean, there's always something <laughs> else to take them away. Take them away. And and they want the payoff. They want to um, feel like their time was well spent. What that means is they're just scanning. They're just zipping through things. And so for you to stand out, you need to really consider that that's the landscape that people are, are in when they're reading what you put out there. Um, the amount of content that is coming at people now is just insane. It's insane. I think this quote is actually four years old. We have so much content coming at us every minute of every day. And that means you're competing with all of it. You're competing with um, target ads, and you're competing with, you're not just competing with other nonprofits, and you're not just competing with, um, you're not just competing with related information, you're competing with all of the information for attention. There are, I think it's 140,000 nonprofits or tax exempt organizations in the United States. No, 1.4 million. Right. I, I was gonna. I was gonna have my notes. My notes. I think it's one point four minutes. So, anyway, a lot, a lot of other nonprofits, and they they are just like this row in the store, and then you've got all the other information in the world to compete with. So that that can be really daunting, especially when you're the one person in an organization trying to write an email. Yeah. So how how do you stand out? How do you compete with all of this? And again, you want to think about your users' needs. So think about your audience and what is it that they actually need from you as an organization, whether that is a donor who is trying to be a part of what you're doing, or a client that you're serving, um, or a volunteer who's getting involved in a non-monetary way. What are their tasks that they're trying to, are they trying to find out your hours of operation? Are they trying to um, find out you know, how a campaign turned out. Did you raise the money? Did you build this, the park? Um, what is it that they're trying to understand? And make it, make it easy for them. Give them instructions so that they know what to do with the information, so that it's not all about you, but they can say, oh, this is my role. This is where I belong. So you need, to do this, you need to rethink your approach. We, when we're working in, um, in any kind of social change or mission-driven work, we have we have our thing that we want to say. We have that like this is what I'm doing. This is what we're doing. This is our goal. 
This is how we are going to change the world. And it's all focused on I, 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 we, we, we. But what does, what does your audience want to know? What do they want to do? What is it that they are trying to um, understand or participate in? And, and what's the role for them? Where do they fit into your work? Um, so they want to know, like, yep, this is it. This is the right place. I know what I'm going to do. Um, my questions are answered. And that's how they end up being on board with you. So I also want to say, I have some examples in here that are, um, I, I use them with love. Like, if I pick on something, I, I'm, I'm often trying to make a point. I know that every single nonprofit that I include here is working really hard to do something really good. <laughs> so when I point out a flaw, it's with love in my heart, I promise. So, um, so this is something, I don't know anything about this organization, which is actually ideal for an example like this, because I don't know anything about this organization. And I come here, and, and I'm looking at, OK, fund for peace. I'm like, I like peace. That's great. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm looking at this, and I'm trying to understand. This is the home page. This is the first. First thing I see on the homepage, Fund for Peace elects new chair of board of trustees. That is evidently the most important thing I need to know about this organization. <laughs> um, I can't, and, and I'm not, I'm talking about photos, but also, also text here. I, I can't see any peace. I, I can't even see any violence or conflict. So I can't respond to either the desired future that I want to help them achieve, nor can I see the current problem that I want to help them to solve. And I for sure can't see anywhere here where I can get involved. Like I don't really, I, I can, I guess they have programs, it says up there. Um, and I can see some of the work that they do, but it's all about them. And then if you look at Kiva, Kiva's like the best example. I use them in every talk. Um, I, I can see exactly where I fit. I can see exactly what they do and how I fit into it. Um, empower people around the world with a $25 loan. They've told me exactly what to do. And I can see the people, look at the people, look at all their faces. Look at, I, it's, it's so exciting to me because I can see, and they're not all the same people. They're different people in different parts of the world. So I can find myself among them. If, I, if, I, if one story resonates with me more than another story, <laughs> there's a lot here. The other thing I wanna point out, um, the repayment rate. Kiva, I, I saw a talk at South by Southwest um, a couple weeks ago, and I heard from someone at Kiva, they, they had um, what equated to a scandal a few years ago where their repayment rate on their loans, I don't know how much you know about Kiva, but they, they, do, they do micro loans to help people um, who wouldn't otherwise get loans. And so anybody in the world can make this micro loan to someone, and then they, they pay it back. But what they found was um, they had these <clears throat> middle men, middle people who, who were paying off the loans even if, if the person receiving the loan defaulted. And it caused this big scandal because it was like, oh, Kiva's lying and it's, you know, it's not true. Everything they've been saying isn't true. And they did a massive overhaul to correct this error. And they they really talked to those people and said, like, look, don't, don't like, let people default on the loan if they default on the loan because we need to tell the truth, we need to be transparent. So this transparency rate, I just, I just took the screenshot this week, that's, that's up to date. That shows, that, that's an, a direct response to a question that people have. Anybody who read that news story, anybody who has sort of heard about Kiva might have that question. So the minute I show up here, first page again, I, I, if I had that question in my head, it's answered already. And so, you know, they really, they really took their reality and reacted to it. So um, my first exercise, I do want to do this exercise because I think uh, it's, it's pretty short and I think it can be useful. Um, it's the first one, it's called It's Not About You. So I want you to just spend a few minutes writing about your organization, just a couple of sentences. And I don't want you to use the word I or we or our. I want you to write about your organization without referring to it. And you get extra credit if you can include the words you or your. So just spend a minute and then I'll, after, after a couple minutes, I'll have you turn to the person next to you and, and practice this. Right. Yeah. 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 
do you have um, an email campaign? Do you have, uh, how, how are things structured? Do you have different audiences? What is, what is the content involved and how is it structured? And then we also, we, we really try to consider the people side of things. And this is where, um, again, nonprofits can get really stuck because if you don't have anybody to do the work, you feel like there's nothing you can do. Or if you, um, if you are getting, so, so you might have workflow problems, you might have problems with how decisions are made, that maybe the decision is being handed down to you and you feel like that's, that makes you really stuck in terms of what you can do online. Um, so when it comes to setting priorities, if you know the content strategy graphic I showed is um, is a little bit elaborate, but what I, what I try to break it down to, especially when I'm talking with nonprofits initially, is that it's really about discovery and behavior change. That what you need to do is discover the problems and opportunities you have, and then change behaviors, either yours or possibly the people around you. Right. Ah, I know. <laughs> So I want to talk about discovery for a bit. That what what that's going to be is um, looking for trends and truths, not what not what you thought you were doing, not what your gut tells you to do, not what you're excited to do, but like what's actually happening with your digital efforts. Looking and I'll talk more about how you can do that. And also um, setting aside pet projects. That's a really hard one. Um, and sometimes they're not your pet projects, but but being able to set aside the things that are draining your resources is just as important as identifying opportunities. Um, behavior change, uh, this, you know, this is going to sound like I'm, I'm simplifying it. Um, allocating the resources where they belong, really making sure that if you have an opportunity that that's where you're putting your efforts, and being able to say, no, we're not doing this anymore. We're going to stop this thing that is completely draining us and isn't getting us anywhere. I would also like to say, before I start talking about discovery, in a lot of organizations, discovery itself is behavior change. Um, slowing down to take a look at things and really dig into the weeds is a form of behavior change. So, so as you consider some of these possibilities, um, you can run into some resistance even at the discovery level. Um, so what do I mean by discovery? Um, discovery <laughs> is really about um, making some time to look around you. Um, and it's not, I, I don't advise doing it alone. <laughs> I, um, I, I think the most important part of discovery is really listening and letting other people tell you about what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, and, not, and not taking their word for it, but like, look at the content, you know, go back through, leaf through things. Um, it sounds time consuming when I, when I talk about some of the, the tactics here. But it is time so well spent. It will save you hours and hours and hours of um, life and hardship later if you take some time um, to do this work. <coughs> so you do want to look at internal factors. You want to look at um, what you do and don't have available, um, what people are doing, which departments are doing things, who is feeding into your digital efforts, who can publish on the website, who is updating the um, Facebook posts. Uh, really get a handle on what's happening. But you also want to look outside of your organization. You want to look at competitors. Um, you want to consider um, different influencers out in the world. And when you're looking at competitors, you are not necessarily looking to be the same as them. And you are not necessarily looking to be different from them. You are looking to be better than them. Right. So that's you want, to, you want to look at what they're doing so that you can reflect back at yourself and say, like, yeah, I would give them my money too. Or how, how can I show that what I'm doing is worth even more than that? <laughs> so when you're looking at, people talk about looking at the data, and a lot of times when people are doing discovery, especially when they're doing the external work, um, they want to read articles or posts and, and get these statistics about what's happening, and, um, and that is important and great and good, and I do not discourage that, but, but I really encourage you to look at yourself, look at your, your own data. Are people um, responding to what you're doing? Are, and, and if they're responding, what are the percentages? How, what's the return on the time that you're putting into things? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some different tools <laughs> and, and approaches that you can use to, to, like, sort of how do you look at yourself? It's, um, there is some more methodical ways you can do that. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about your audience. And I know that 
for most nonprofits, um, if not all, there's more than one audience that you usually have um, a, a client or a recipient of the good work you're doing, whether that's a community or animals or not that animals are online, but you know, you have you have a recipient of the work that you're doing, but you also have your audience um, that is contributing the money to your work. And as you consider each audience, you know, we talked a little bit about making that shift from I and we and our to you and your. <laughs> um, but getting into more depth about like what tasks are they trying to complete? What um, what are their what are their concerns? What are their barriers to getting involved? Um, what is it that makes them excited and motivated to be a part of something? And what is it that discourages them? Um, so, so really try, try to think at the highest level, what is it that they want? What's the desired future or outcome or change or participation that they want? And it's not going to be anything, <laughs> you know, like I want to write a check to this nonprofit so that they can keep their budget going for 2014. Like that's not their goal. They want what they want. They want their... Um, their better, brighter future. They want the world to be different. They want the world to improve, and they want to be part of it. So, so as you're thinking about your audience and the work that you do and how it connects, really try to connect at that personal level to what it means to them. And I will say, this is a word of caution when you're doing audience research. If you're doing um, any kind of surveys or if, you, if you've got like an info box where you're receiving email, um, don't conflate comments with data. So some, somebody in your organization may hear like, I talked to somebody and she was looking for this on the website and she could not find it. And people get just so worked up about it. But if it's one person and if it's something really weird that isn't related to the, you know, the larger audience, that's okay. It's okay to disappoint somebody once. <laughs> now if you start to see patterns, if you do this, if you do a survey and you start to hear from people, you know, actually the, the, one of the, we did a customer survey and one of the things we heard was that our, our big conference was too expensive for nonprofits. So that's why we made a small conference. And you know, we had to cut the costs, it can only be one day and whatever, but, but if, you don't, <laughs> if, you, if you don't actually see what they're doing, but, but we also had to confirm that with data. We had to look and see you know, how many people are registering for the big conference, how many people are emailing us, how many of these comments did we get, because you really want to be able to, to quantify that. Um, don't take someone's word for it. Um, and and another, another thing you can do to sort of quantify um, ideas is to use personas. And a persona is really just like a make-believe person who represents a group. So if you have three different kinds of donors, you can sort of come up with that donor's persona, like, well, what, what's this person like? You know, is it um, someone really wealthy who gives to a lot of charities? Is it, is, it, is it somebody who's just really super excited about this specific kind of work? Are they locally motivated? Are, you know, really trying to understand what each unique audience um, wants and, again, what their top tasks are. Um, as you do all of this audience research, there is a danger, and the danger is you will become so audience focused that you will forget that you have to stay in business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you want to be, you want to create content that is audience focused, but you need to keep in mind how it drives your business forward. And, and again, I, I say the word business, meaning um, your financial model. Because even nonprofits, um, you know, you, nobody's in it for the money, but you, you still need to figure out like, how can you keep the lights on? How can you drive forward? How can you do more with what you have? So, so what is it that you want your constituents to know and understand? You can still have that. You don't, you don't want to write your content that way necessarily, but that's still driving your work forward. And you know, what do you want them to do? Is it, you know, it's not, I, I, um, I heard a talk recently by um, Paul, Paul Young, I think was his name, at Charity Water, and he talked about how most nonprofit campaigns, um, the experience is terrible. Because it, it, you, they just say, please give us money, and then you give them money, and you never hear from them again. Uh, and that's that's the you know that's what you want them to do. 
it's still okay that you want them to give money, but but he talked about some ways that they've tried to make that appealing and fun and interesting and hopeful. And then that's really that really feeds into how do you retain those people or or give them an experience that makes them want to tell other people like you should you should participate you should volunteer with this group they're great. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about different financial models and how they tie to content and digital strategy. Um, so individual donors are going to give to campaigns and, and that's when you need volume. You need lots and lots and lots of people to give to a campaign. If you're looking for little bits of money at a time, you need to find content that motivates the masses. Not every organization needs to do that, by the way. Not every organization needs thousands of donors. In, in fact, the infrastructure you would need to handle that could, that could really put you under. <coughs> But an example of this is Charity Water. <laughs> Everybody has a birthday. So Charity Water has created a campaign around birthdays. Um, what they encourage people to do is, on your birthday, ask your friends to give money to Charity Water. And they have a really nice functionality set up, so they make it really easy to do. And then every person who has a birthday has lots of friends. Well, <laughs> and <laughs> so, so that when you, when you set this up, um, their content, their digital strategy matches a reality. That they, if, they, if what they really need is $10 at a time from millions of people, they've set it up to do that. Um, but not every nonprofit gets their money from small donations from lots of people. There are also large donations. There are companies, or um, there are grantors that are giving, you know, the big check. Everybody loves the big check. Um, but then you need to have content that matches that. And um, this is an organization, Navy Marine Corps Relief Society. The work that they do is providing um, basically an alternative to payday loans for soldiers. So they, their website, this is, not on, this, is, this is one of the items on their homepage. They do have a carousel. But they, a lot of their donations come from um, high-ranking officers who give large quantities of money. So they, they really needed to be able to retain that. They needed to be able to speak to that audience. Now you'll note that all of the um, navigational items and the three biggest action items on the right <coughs> are not for that audience. Um, they've, they've still kept their site clean for clients, for the soldiers who need, um, need money or need assistance, but they've, they've found a way to talk to this audience. <coughs> Another audience, um, some nonprofits really speak to consumers, sometimes what you're doing has a value. It has, um, and well, everything you're doing has value, but has a monetary value for a consumer that is independent of the work that you're doing. It's independent of, of your mission. And these are people who um, could be convinced to buy something from you instead of somebody else. So if it's something they're going to buy anyway, like a U2 song, um, you know, obviously we don't all have the luxury of having the hookup with U2, but, but <laughs> Red is an organization um, that is working to end AIDS in Africa. And they did a promotion during the Super Bowl. Again, you really need to know the right people for these things. Right. But, but if, if, you can, if you have something else, I mean, I think more locally, um, NPR does a lot of uh, unique items. You know, there are albums that you can only buy through them. There are, um, you know, specially designed artwork or tote bags or things that, that are local that you can only get by becoming a member. So if you can have a service or a thing, this is another way to generate money. Or again, if you can somehow wrangle a date with George Clooney, this is a great way to, to give consumers something they want. Christina Halverson, my boss, would love to go on a date with George Clooney. And I did, in fact, give these nice people $10 of my money. Because, because that's my only chance. I can't buy that opportunity anywhere else. I had never heard of this organization. I had never heard of this organization. But they had something that I wanted to buy for Christina. So, that's how they got my money. Um, and again, money isn't everything. And I suspect for a lot of the nonprofits in this room, um, a lot of your work is happening through volunteers or it's happening through in-kind services. Um, there are groups that do legal services or um, you know, cooking meals. There, there are so many different ways that nonprofits get their work done. And so your, your content doesn't necessarily have to be financially driven, but it does have to drive your work forward. So if your business model is, is one that is dependent on volunteer work, then that's, that's your audience. 
Um, when people, when any of these audiences come to you, they're, they're often looking for free information or free advice or free help or free something. A free volunteer, you know, make it easy for me to volunteer. But when it comes to digital content, free stuff is never free. But you actually have to invest a lot of your time and your resources to make anything happen online. Um, whether that is um, an email newsletter that you publish every month or um, press releases that you're sending out, any, any kind of content that you are creating to try and get attention online costs you. And so just keep in mind that before you invest in any one of these efforts, you really need to remember how it drives your model forward. Um, and in terms of calculating the costs, um, I, I always recommend calculating time and salary. <laughs> and actually, you know, if you, if you have a budget, I think sometimes people have a budget for software or they have a budget for, you know, like whether or not they put any money into something new with the website or some new widget or something. But, but really calculating the cost of time and people's resources, I mean, it, it's not always a good idea to have your most senior person in your organization writing something um, for fun or that doesn't get used or that's, you know, that it, it, while that might be very appealing to that person, um, it, it may not be the best use of time. But if it's something really high profile, if, you're, if you get a lot of attention from a campaign because you've got that person's personalized message, I mean, then you know it is a good return. <coughs> So really, when you're when you're thinking about setting priorities, think in terms of like, what are you what are you putting into your digital efforts? Where are you investing your time and money in your individual efforts, and how is that coming back? Like, how is it returning to you? Are you, um, you know, some people there there I often hear like, well, you have to have YouTube or you have to have Facebook, but why? I mean, is it helping? Is it working? And and if it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be clicks or likes or, you know, you, depending on the measurement that you're looking for. But if, if, pe if people are hearing about you that way and you're getting either donations or participation, then it's worth doing. <coughs> so that was sort of the um, talking about your audience and your business. Um, now I want to talk really more about the content itself, like the stuff you make. And, and I want to talk about different ways that you can audit what you have. <coughs> Um, sometimes you, you do just a quantitative audit to just understand how many things there are. How many things are we doing? Whether it's the number of emails you're sending out, the number of um, blog posts you're publishing, just really get a handle on that. <coughs> um, qualitative audits can break into two categories. One is where you're really measuring for best practices, and it might be some of those things we talked about in terms of shifting from I language to you language. Um, or other best, I'll talk a little bit more about writing best practices when I talk about behavior change. Um, but then there, there can also be a strategic uh, quality to an audit where you, you have a strategic goal in mind and you're, you're auditing your content to see whether or not it lines up with that strategic goal. Um, so if your goal is to <coughs> increase the number of people who show up at your events, and then, then how is your content aligning with that? Um, oh, I, I talked through all these slides already. Sorry. Um, so, so the different kinds of audits. This, this is what an audit would actually look like. Um, you, it doesn't have to be a spreadsheet, but you really, it's really granular. It's really just like we have one of these that happened then. Here, you know, here's where you'll find it. Keeping track of maybe who created it if that's relevant, or what department created it if that's relevant. But really getting a handle on we have this many. We did this many things. Um, the qualitative notes that you can make can cover um, some of what's right or wrong. Like, wow, this is this stuff's really good, or it's really it's really doing what we had hoped it would do. You're not just looking for problems; you're looking for successes as well. Um, I know that that going through all of your stuff sounds like maybe the worst thing in the world. <laughs> that it can be really time. You know, if you're looking through every page of a website or looking back at every newsletter over a year or or every whatever. It sounds like that might be terrible, but you really do have to do it. If you, if you want to set smart digital priorities, you really need to know what you're doing. And um, and as I said earlier, the time you spend on it will be time well spent. Um, 
So I want to talk a little bit, I want to tell a few stories of things that I have discovered in auditing. And Lynette knows the first story. <laughs> um, I worked at a nonprofit organization where we published newsletters. And it wasn't my department. I, I am not good at not sticking my nose in other people's business. But I was, I was working in publishing, and I knew that marketing was publishing a newsletter, and then I heard that our community outreach people were publishing a newsletter, and I just sort of started asking questions, and I started documenting, like, what did we audit? Or I started auditing um, what did we send out in terms of newsletters. <laughs> and what I found is that we, were, we, were, we had four people publishing four newsletters for two audiences. Um, and they weren't working yet. They all had their own um, goals, and they all had some email addresses, and they, you know, they were all doing good work trying to get their things done. But nobody had ever stopped to say, like, what are, what are we all doing here? <laughs> so, so there were some lines that we were able to draw between uh, once we audited and said, okay, well, what's in this one? How often does it go out? Who's receiving it? We could draw all these lines and say, oh, well, that's, that seems like a lot of work. For, um, for two audiences who maybe, you know, the, it was really one audience getting one newsletter, the other audience getting three. So we were able to talk about that because we stopped and did an audit. Um, this, this was my church's website a year ago. <laughs> and um, and we, did, we did an audit of the website to sort of figure out, like, you know, we're trying to, we, we did a redesign, which you saw earlier. Um, but we also wanted to see, like, how's, how's the content? Like, how does this position us as a, as a church in the community? And what we started to see, we, we, our, we, we, our. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm thinking about going to a religious organization for the first time, I, I, I'm thinking about myself <laughs> and how it's going to feel. So, so we really shifted a lot of our language, um, because, but, but it didn't feel bad or wrong and good, nice, smart people had written it. It wasn't that anybody had done anything on purpose to exclude somebody, but it wasn't until we stopped to really read and think that way that we discovered some of this language. Um, this, is, this, is me. this is me owning my stuff now. Um, I hate LinkedIn. I hate it so much, and I could give you a two-hour talk about everything I hate about it, and it's just personal, it's not business. I just hate it. But when I did a social media audit for, um, for Confab, what I learned is that um, higher ed people who work in web are very active in this higher ed web content group. They like it. I don't like it, but they like it. So I can't ignore it. I can't, um, you know, that was, that was my discovery was I can't stick my head in the sand and say that I hate LinkedIn. I, I need to be active. So Georgie Cullen, um, she's our partner on our higher ed event. And, and she, she doesn't hate LinkedIn, so I just let her do the posts. But, but, I, but it, was, it, was an, it was an eye opening experience for me that I just thought, who would like LinkedIn? Ugh, I hate it. But, but I had to look and I found that, that there was actually a lot of activity. So it's not until you, you sit down and, and audit and really make your lists and look at all the things that you can discover some of these um, truths. Um, one of the questions that you all asked. Um, I, I had a couple of people ask before this talk was, you know, what about channels? I have trouble deciding which channels. Um, you know, do I need to have a YouTube account? Do I need to have a Twitter account? Do I, um, or how much time should I spend doing one or the other? And um, the answer is, of course, that it depends. But, but this is one of the questions you can answer with an audit. Um, <coughs> the last question about mobile came up sort of as a channel. You, you do need to be accessible on mobile, I will say that, whether it's a, a mobile website or a responsive site that is visible on mobile. You, you can't have a flash site that doesn't show up on mobile anymore um, because that's just where more and more web use is happening. But um, when it comes to different channels, uh, don't, don't get swept up with the pressure of the new and the shiny. It's uh, look, look at what your people are doing and what they actually want. Um, I, there was a talk that um, Christina Halverson gave last, at, South by Southwest also, and she was talking about how she had some organization who their their content team was struggling because somebody in one of the higher ups had said like, we need to have a YouTube channel. We need to have a YouTube channel. She's like, you sell toilet paper. <laughs> it's not a priority. That's not. That's not it's <coughs> you don't need to have anything. That's 
you know, it's, you need to be able to communicate with your audiences where they want to hear from you. That's what you need. So when it comes to channels, I mean, doing some of this discovery work can really help you find the opportunities and, and hopefully ignore the noise. If there are things that just you have no business doing, that's okay. Just let it happen. Let, let things reveal themselves. You'll be amazed at what you find while you're doing discovery. And um, just as important as digging into your data, doing your you know, surveys or um, scanning through what you already have is asking the people around you. Both, you can interview people inside your organization and outside of your organization. Um, interviews are amazing. They're amazing. Um, the things that I have learned because I ask questions uh, have been the things that have just blown me away. And I'll, I'll tell some more stories about that. <laughs> don't be afraid to, to ask a stupid question. Don't be afraid to, um, to, to not know things and reveal that you don't know them because what you'll learn in the process can be really valuable. Um, I like to use questions that sort of focus on these four areas of content strategy, so substance, structure, workflow, and governance. Um, but, but I ask these questions to, to people who are doing the work. So I, I might ask it to the president of a company. I might ask it to the marketing person. I might ask it to an outreach person um, so that I get all the different answers. But who are you trying to reach? What is the purpose? What do you think is the purpose of our website or our Facebook page? Um, and then how, how is it all organized? You know, who's, who's posting to Twitter? Who is sending out the emails? Um, and then I like to really understand how things work. Um, yesterday I was uh, interviewing, this is again for my um, church website, and they, I, I was asking about the email, um, and I was asking all these questions about, well, who's on which mailing list? And it, and it turned out that there, there were two things that were happening. There's a monthly email and a weekly email, and in theory, everybody would want to be on both lists, but they had opted in to different lists at different times. And so there was a whole group of people who were missing half of the information um, in both directions. And it, it wasn't until I was asking these questions that I discovered it. And, and they, had, they hadn't discovered it. It wasn't something that had even occurred to them until I started saying, well, how did this happen? And when did people sign up? And how did they sign up? And that's the kind of question that can, it, I did not go into this looking for anything to do with email at all. <laughs> but, but by asking questions, I sort of unearthed this, this opportunity that is really easy to solve. Um, sometimes there's, there's a challenge of um, governance. So who's making decisions? That's, that it's not that everybody doesn't know like the website's broken or everybody knows we need this or everybody knows. It's sort of this, uh, this stated, understood thing. But how, do we, how do we make decisions? How do we push things forward? <laughs> and sometimes just by starting the conversation, you can raise the need for it, and people will get on board with, with either making different procedures or different decisions. Um, so remember those newsletters I talked about? The, uh, when I was doing the audit for those newsletters, I was interviewing people. <coughs> and the, um, the first person I interviewed was really passionate about her newsletter. She was like, she worked really hard on it. And I got a little bit of resistance at first. It's like, why do you want to know about my newsletter? <laughs> Back off, it's mine. And it was someone I got along with really well, but I definitely had a little butting heads over this asking questions business. Um, and I just tried to play cool. I was like, I'm just asking, just want to know. I heard there's all these newsletters. I just want to get a handle on it. Um, and I had, I had just gotten involved in the fourth newsletter, which is how I initially started asking questions. So I interviewed her, and it turned out she was creating amazing content. She was out in the field, she was collecting <coughs> stories, um, she had photos, she had all the best content. Um, and then I talked to the other two people, and, and the other two people were definitely working with more of a sales focus. One was the marketing person who was basically just publishing excerpts from the catalog every month. Like, buy the stuff, buy the stuff, please buy the stuff. Um, then the third uh, of these three that were writing for the same audience <coughs> was working with trainers who were also out in the field and also had great stories, but they had a smaller mailing list. So when I realized that it was, it was really the same 
audience for all three of these, um, I said, well, maybe we could do something a little different and combine these together. What if we combine the mailing list and said, hey, we've, we've changed our changed our email. Hope you still like it. You can opt out. You know, if people didn't want it, they didn't have to keep getting it. But um, we had the person who was out in the communities with these amazing stories and these amazing photos. She would contribute articles. We had the... Um, the trainer, who also was collecting stories, also contributed articles, and he got to send this to a lot more people. That you know, he got more email addresses. The marketing person was thrilled because there was stuff to go in it now. <laughs> it wasn't just selling stuff. And um, <coughs> and I was in the publishing department, so I also created an editorial calendar and gave them an editor, which none of them had had. Um, the, uh, the marketing person, I think, had been running things throughout trouble. They're like, you're going to edit it? That's so great. <laughs> um, so, so all of a sudden, something that was feeling really like exhausting, it was consuming so many resources, so many people were working so hard on it, all of a sudden we found this new way to put it together, and the, who really benefited the most was the readers, because that newsletter was awesome. It had stories, it had photos, it had the resources that were for sale. But it wasn't like, buy the stuff, buy the stuff, buy the stuff. So it was a much stronger piece. It was, um, it, it met everybody's needs. It was less work. And it reached more people because we combined the mailing list. So I really, but, but the, if I had just done an audit without the interview, without asking the questions, I wouldn't have gotten into that level of detail. And I wouldn't have said, well, how are you finding those stories? And who's on that list? And, you know, it's, it's, those, it's those sort of, Sometimes they feel a little bit nosy, <laughs> but if you can ask those questions, that's how you find these opportunities. Because if you don't ask, you just keep doing it. You just keep doing what you're doing. Um, it's very easy to move forward of your own momentum, and, um, and it's very hard to, it, it feels like you're doing one more thing, like, oh, now I gotta do this audit and do these interviews, and I don't have any time. But the time that it could potentially save you down the road is massive. Um, this, you know, the, the name of the talk was like, yes, but why? And that's that's what that's what happens during discovery. Like, why do we have so many of these things, or why don't we have one of the, why, you know, why don't we have a Facebook page if that's an opportunity? Why, you know, why are people working this way? Why are we spending so much money on this and no money on that? This is your opportunity to stop and ask that question. So, if you've done discovery and you have your, you've identified your opportunities, you've identified your, your weak spots and your strengths, what do you do? Behavior change, the easy part, right? <laughs> that's, that's no problem. People will just change everything they're doing. Not, not easily. <laughs> so I, I really, um, and I'm obviously biased because I work at an organization that is all about content strategy. But creating a strategy for the work you do online makes all the difference in the world. Figuring out what, what your digital stuff does for people, um, both for you and your users, can make a huge difference. Um, if you're going to do a core strategy, I, I, we actually like to write it in the form of a statement, and I'll show you an example of that. But you really want something that is is focus on the future that re remains true no matter what you're talking about. So whether it's your email or your website, I'm not talking about a tactical goal. I'm talking about your big picture strategy. Um, and and this is about how how the how it feeds into your business model, how it serves your audiences, all that stuff we talked about earlier. But you want to boil it down into something simple. Um, having something that is is a little bit a little bit aspirational, but it's also really tangible. That it can be um, that it includes all of your efforts. That it can make people feel sort of motivated and excited about your work. And this is an example. This is a real core strategy statement that um, I helped write for a nonprofit. And and we break it into pieces when we write these because we want it to have um, we want it to have more than one application. I guess is how I put it. But it needs to be catchy. It needs to be like a slogan. And this doesn't appear anywhere on your website or on your Twitter feed. This is, this is just for you. This is just for your team. Um, 
this is an organization, this is that same organization that provides loans for, um, for soldiers who are kind of living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and their, their work was really dependent on both volunteers and donors. They had a huge, they had the most impressive volunteer force I have ever seen in my life. Um, so volunteers were a huge audience. But so were donors, and they needed to meet all three. This, and this is a website project, <laughs> but they wanted something that would suit um, all of their campaigns. So they, they really talked about how the work that they did happened face to face. They, they, don't, um, they don't communicate online with their clients that much. They don't, um, and you know, the, the volunteers come in and work face to face, and the clients come in to get help face to face. And they do all of this um, consultation one on one. So one of the primary goals for their strategy is get them in the door. Like if that's how your business model works, if that's how your organization works, then then all of your content needs to get people in the door. Um, they also had a, a lot of longevity. I know a lot of organizations will say like founded in this year or you know we've been doing this for sixty years. Um, they needed to spin that in a way. I mean, it was a strength of the organization. And that's why we said here today, here tomorrow. That that's, they, they have been like a family to generations of soldiers. So being able to put that in a, in a way that honored what their organization was and what their longevity meant, but to make it useful to the person who's coming to the site. And then um, clients come first. I really, really encourage you to identify a primary audience. If you, even if you have multiple audiences, most people do, figure out who's coming to the website and why. If people are looking for your hours of operation and you're asking for money, um, not helpful. If, if, um, if people are looking to be part of some, like a campaign and you make it hard to find the donation, also not helpful. <laughs> so, so really figuring out who comes first, who, who on, your, um, on your list comes first. Um, and then once you have a statement like that, it, it becomes like a compass. It becomes the thing that um, when, you're, when you say like, let's start a blog, you can say, well, does the blog welcome people into the family? Like you can, you can go back to your statement and figure out <coughs> if it does or if it doesn't, how it might, how, you know, um, it's okay to say no to things, whether they are new or old, <laughs> but once you have this core, you can sort of weed out the things that you don't need to be doing. Um, I have a core strategy exercise. Do you guys, I, the, I know the last time I spoke, um, people didn't really want as much time for exercises. Did you find the last one helpful? Do you want to do another one or do you want me to keep talking? Who here would like to stop and do an exercise? Okay, well, I'll keep talking. <laughs> so I, what I put in there is um, I, I broke it into pieces. There's an exercise that you can do. If you want to write a statement um, with your organization, there, I broke it into pieces so you can sort of start to think about how those pieces fit together for you and the work that you do. Um, the, the other thing that becomes useful is a message hierarchy. And I want to say really loud and clear that when I'm talking about this message hierarchy, this is, this is nothing, again, that appears on your site. There are words that you need to have in your brain and in your heart that nobody ever reads. These are, these are your your guideposts that help you create digital content um, that meets your priorities. So a message hierarchy is really about prioritizing. And you've probably seen something like this somewhere. This is that same example from the, um, the group that served soldiers. What is, what is the first impression? If somebody clicks open your email, or lands on your Facebook page, or lands on your website, what's the first impression? It's the first thing in one or two seconds, like, like, oh, these people are, or this place is, you know, what's that first impression? If that's not, you know, again, thinking back on that fund for peace, I had a terrible first impression. Like, they, they're probably doing the best work in the whole world, but, but my first impression was like, it, it was, there was nothing I could latch onto. Um, in 10 seconds, there's, there's a little bit more time. You want to be able to say, like, well, what can somebody digest if they, if they actually read a little bit? If they don't just glance, but if they actually read a little bit, what's your what's the next level of messaging? And so for this organization, the first the, the super immediate impression was we want to help. Like I I came somewhere and they want to help. 
The second impression was how they help. They help service members. And they help them for both today and tomorrow. They were very focused on um, financial health and security for the long term. So they, want, they wanted that message to be clear pretty quickly. And then once, you know, if someone spends two minutes looking around, that's when you can get into the, the details of what you do. Um, and again, you want it to be things that resonate with people, like, oh, these are people just like me. And these are, um, these are families, these are other families that are like me. These are other, um, you know, in different organizations it might be, these are other people who really care about the environment. These are other people who really care about history. Um, so, but, but you, you want to scale your content to, to sort of meet the immediacy of that first impression. Because if you jump from, if you jump right to this, if you try to do this first, um, you're not going to give that first impression. Um, again, I have an exercise which we, we can skip, but I, I, I put a pyramid in there and you guys can start to think about that. What, what are the, the different levels of um, resonance that you want people to have with you? What are, what are the first, second, and longer impressions you want people to have? Um, the other behavioral change, you know, we did, we did a little writing exercise earlier. And um, I, do, I do not want to undersell how challenging it is to create good content. And it's, it's challenging even if you think you're a great writer, even if you've been writing forever. I, every single email I ever write, and I write a lot of them, I go back through and strip out the we language. And, I, and there's still some in there, <laughs> because sometimes you have to say we. But, but every single email I write, I, I look back at it two days later, and I'm like, oh, curses. Okay. Have tighten that up. I could make it shorter. That label wasn't good. So, so there's nothing. Um, it's it's hard. It's and there's a lot of nuance to it. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about better writing. And this is this is not just for yourself, but within your organization. That you might spot. You know, some of these things might be like, oh, that doesn't. You know, that's not relevant. But you might spot one thing in here, like, oh, that's what we do. Like that's the thing that we really need to work on. So I'm just going to cover some of the the common pitfalls. Um, when writing is bad online, you can tell that it's um, sometimes people um, don't don't use editorial skills, and you can get annoyed by by typos or whatever. But often it's it's really more that it's um, it's not useful. It's not it's sort of aimless. Like what I don't know why this person wrote this paragraph. I, it's not for me. And again, I'm not sitting down to read a book. I'm I'm clicking and trying to get something done. <laughs> and we talked about what are, what are the signs of good content, but it's useful. I can find what I need. It's easy to use. Um, so, so know what I want. Know what I'm trying to get done. Help me get it done. And um, deliver on your promises. Don't, don't say you're going to help me change the world and then give me nothing to do. Don't, you know, don't, um, don't bait me in with some, like, touchy feely story and then try to get me to give me money. You know, like don't bait and switch. There's there are appropriate times and, and again, imagine you're a person. Think about what, what are those appropriate times to ask for money? What are those appropriate times to um, connect to another article? What are the appropriate you know, what are the appropriate times to refer someone like maybe you should call us? And and really try to deliver on your promises instead instead of saying like, pay attention to us, pay attention to us, pay attention to us, be really be really useful. Because that's that, then people will pay attention to you. Um, the the usable aspect there there are there are a lot of things you can do to make your content more usable. The I think the, I think the trickiest part is really creating clear labels and headings. That if you sometimes people like to be sort of um, and I am like the worst offender with this. I think I'm really clever. I'll try to write something funny. Or I'll try to write something that is um, more elaborate than it needs to be. Like just call things what they are, label them accurately, keep it short. I am very verbose, as you can see from my slides. I'm terrible at slides. I but the the shorter you can keep your copy, the clearer you can keep your labels, the better. Um, making things findable is really a lot of that is about navigation. So not having like, can we get one more thing in the bar at the top of the page? Like, you know, not having a million choices, but having clear choices and letting people drill down into what you're doing. Um, 
or or you know not calling your Facebook page something weird. <laughs> there there are organizations that that uh, you know if, if you know that people call you something that's like shorthand, that's what you should be on. You know, and then you can put in parentheses your long name or your acronym or whatever you know. But really try to make yourself findable. Um, and then just be likable, be reasonable, be just you know right. Right without, oops, I went too fast. Um, right without sort of trying to impress. Avoid, avoid that kind of marketing speak or that, that spin on things. Um, just, you know, simpler words, simpler language. Uh, there's nobody who is going to read what you wrote and think, oh, if only you had used three syllables instead of one. That's, that's never going to happen. Nobody is ever going to think, like, you don't sound smart enough. Um, because People just want to understand what you're trying to tell them. Um, oh, sorry, I'm clicking too fast. Th these are I, you can I, these are slides that I took from another deck, and these are the ones that are like one sentence at a time. But oh, Chris says I didn't take that out before I put this in here. Um, the uh, so I'm sorry if I keep skipping ahead to the wrong slide. Uh, when you're cutting, I I re this is like this is my number one. But you can always cut more. You can almost always cut more and more and more. Um, oh, the, I've got an example coming up. I, let me see a minute. OK, sorry. Sorry. Um, the, the, there are a lot of things we want to say, and, I, and, and this will be covered in, the, in this jargon exercise, too. This exercise we'll actually do together with WhatsApp. But um, when you have like long, exam, long explanations of things, you may feel like it's all really necessary. You may feel like, well, I have to tell them this, and this, and this, and this. And you'll be amazed by what you can strip out. So um, jargon is another, another problem where it's, it's, not just an, it's not just a matter of like the quantity of words, but the kind of words. A lot of, especially in nonprofits, we have sort of our lingo, like within a field or within, a, within an area of um, social change, there will be these kind of buzzwords or lingo. And you can really bury yourself in them. So I want to I want to show you an example. And this is also in your um, in your packet. Now this is imaginary. I didn't pick on any real nonprofit, but I picked phrases that I really saw on real nonprofit sites. So these so this is fake but real. Um, I'm going to read the whole thing because it's terrible. Founded in 1982, the Coalition for Nonviolent Happiness, CNH, a nonprofit, non religious, tax exempt research organization, was established to further the study of positivity, raise awareness about ongoing nonviolence efforts, and increase the importance of happy experiences, as well as instigate the formulation of proactive U.S. policies toward increased optimism. Since its inception, CNH has been one of the most vocal and far reaching U.S. private bodies dealing with the entire spectrum of systemic societal pro happiness efforts. Have you ever read anything like this anywhere on the internet? <laughs> yes, yes, we have. We see it all the time because all of these things are really important from CNH's perspective. These are all the things you need to know about us. These are all the things we're doing. These are all the things we have done. This is why it matters. This is what we're attached to. But really, when I think about which words matter, which words I really need to be able to understand what this group does, there aren't that many. There really are not that many. Like I feel like I could get the gist as as somebody who is maybe considering volunteering or donating or even working there. <laughs> I I don't need all of that. There's a much simpler way to say most things. There is a much um, less wordy, less pretentious, shorter, <laughs> simpler way to say most things. And. And when we've, especially when we've been working somewhere for a long time, I think we can just get kind of mired in like, this is our thing, this is what we do, this is how we do it, this is, and we can get really stuck in our own language. Try, try to back way off and, and really think about like, well, if you were explaining this to someone on the street, how would you explain it? Um, making things easy to scan, that was the other thing, that was a huge block of text. Um, really making things simpler with um, clear labels, breaking things up into lists, breaking things. And I, you know, I'm, I, I come from book publishing and I can read paragraphs and I can write paragraphs and I, I, I love words. I can't, I can't tell you um, 
how, how, much, how many more words I could have fit on any individual slide, believe it or not. But, but breaking things up, and there, there are some guidelines here. I will give the, um, the deck to Carrie too, I should have mentioned that before. But, but really breaking things into short paragraphs with short headings. Um, the length of a page is less. I, I always find that a little bit of a moving target because people will scroll. If you if you have a lot and it's all broken up neatly, I don't think there's, I'm sure there is such a thing as a page that's too long, but page length, both on a phone or on desktop, is less important than readability. So really breaking things up into manageable length for reading. Um, I also encourage, like, I, I read that last thing out loud, because you can read, I assume, uh, you can read, you get, you can kind of understand that, but when I read it out loud, you hear how ridiculous it is in a different way that you can, you know, you might read something with your eyes and quietly to yourself and think, that's fine, it's fine. But reading it out loud really forces you to hear the cadence and um, and sort of, you, you can really spot the, the ridiculousness sometimes of some of your jargon. Um, yeah, the other, the self-referential, here at our organization, we do this. Like at this company, it, it you know they most people will know who you are either from the subject line of your email or because they're on your Twitter feed or because they're on your site. So you you don't have to refer to yourself. Um, this was the example that I thought was earlier. Uh, using active words, really, you know, you can say as much as you want about yourself, but give people an action. Give them something to do. Give them somewhere to connect. So um, strong verbs that give them, you know, saying, you know, help us is fine. You know, that's, but saying bring clean and safe drinking water to every person in the world, that, that's a really active way to bring people in. And that's, that's, the, that's the point. That's, you know, the, the longer version is accurate, but the point is that you want people to get involved with the short version. Um, I want to talk a little bit about voice and tone. Um, and I'm, if I, I think a couple of you were at the last talk, and I, I went over that there. But um, you're, you should always be you. Your organization has a voice. You're always, you're always yourself. Um, but your tone needs to shift. So if you're talking to um, somebody who's experiencing a housing crisis versus a wealthy donor, those are two different situations. You want to adjust your tone to match the situation. Um, but your, your content is not always in your control. So you want to you want to think about your content and the way it's structured so that it sort of matches the situation. It's one thing if you know you're on a phone call and you know exactly who that person is and you're talking to them. But but when you are writing, um, you know, don't write from your desk. Write from where they are. Write from what's happening. Um, the voice is the unified sound. That's that's how you all that's how you always sound. You, you know, you maybe you are um, you're a smart organization, or maybe you're fun, or um, maybe you're really earnest, and that's your voice. That's you're always going to be that way, <laughs> but you want to shift your tone and think about you know your mom talks to you, and she's always your mom, and she she never stops being your mom, but she's going to have a really different conversation with you about something hilarious that happened at the family reunion versus um, you know someone in the family is sick. So really, really pay attention to how you're using tone in your writing or in your video in, in any of your content. <coughs> um, I put this in here because a few of you, I think, I think a couple of people asked about um, sort of having an editorial checklist. How do you enforce these things across different writers? Um, and I included the checklist in your in your handouts too. This is just a starter, but but giving people something that they can actually go through and say like, yep, 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 yep. Making something really tangible that, that other people can use. And even if people aren't, I mean, I don't know very many organizations where people actually check off a list every single time they write. Certainly not in a nonprofit where you don't have the time and money for that. But even distributing this list, even putting this kind of a list in front of people to say like, this is what we care about. This is what should be happening on all the blog posts. This is what should be happening on all the email campaigns. It can be really helpful because it just brings to the top of mind, like, oh, right, yeah, I did, I did use jargon, or um, I don't have a clear call to action. They don't know what to do. So, so putting some of these in here um, can be really helpful. Um, working smarter. So we talked a little bit about 
behavioral change in, in terms of like how you can improve your content. But there are ways you can improve the way you work with your colleagues too, or, the, or even the way you work by yourself. Like what are your resources? What kinds of teams do you have? What kinds of meetings do you have? Are there too many of them? Are they getting things done? Really stopping to look at um, you know, how you make decisions, how you work together, <laughs> and not being afraid to, um, to say when the emperor has no clothes. Not being afraid to say, like, I love you guys, but if we have a two hour meeting every week, we'll never get anywhere with this. Um, or to say, like, you know what, this meeting is awesome and we always get a ton done. Why do we only have it once a month? Um, so, so really looking at the ways that you work together and what's helping, um, what's helping drive your digital efforts forward. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways you can change. You can change who is doing what. You can change um, your process, you know, adding an editorial checklist. You can change um, just the way that you get together to make decisions, but be, be open to it. And, and, you know, when I talked earlier about how discovery can be a form of behavioral change, the resistance that you get from others, either colleagues or higher up, the resistance that you get to new ideas or different ideas can really be mitigated when you have information. So when you have that data, when you can say, We're, we have four people writing four newsletters for two audiences, it is much easier to get buy-in from other people. It is much easier to say, like, let's do something different. If you, and that's why that discovery part is such an important part of the process. You can't, you know, anybody could set priorities. You just have to say, like, this is a priority. Um, and the reason that doesn't work is because people aren't convinced. Or it's, um, you know, you need to really have that evidence that it's, it's worth doing. Um, make time, make time. I, I've said this, I think, I don't know, three times already. Uh, it can be really hard to slow down and do this kind of work. It can be really hard <coughs> to convince your boss that you need to slow down and do this kind of work. Um, but, but the time you save will outweigh the time you put into it nine times out of ten. I've, I have never, I have never slowed down to do a discovery process or to do this kind of research <coughs> and to make this kind of change without feeling like it was worth doing. Um, and just let go. Let go of the things that are not working. Let go of the things that you, it's, it's okay to, you know, the best thing you can do when you, when you quote unquote fail is to, um, to really learn not to do it. <laughs> that it's, it's, it is okay to work really hard at something and to find out that it wasn't working. Um, that, that's not actually a failure, that, that's something you learn. But being willing to stop is, um, is always hard. And it's, I, I think again, getting back to the, superhero on the bike. It's really hard to throw away work that is close to our hearts. It's really hard to say, man, I put my heart and soul into that campaign and nobody signed up. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's really discouraging, um, but it's not bad. <laughs> it's good because the minute you let it go, you have time for other things that will pay off. Um, and so when you think about those constraints, when you think about not having time or something didn't work, um, I really want you to believe that um, constraints are, are your friend. That when you are working with limited resources, limited um, technology or know-how or whatever, that, that it forces you to be really targeted in your efforts. As much as it feels like your hands are tied or you, you don't have what you need, it, it can be an opportunity to be um, really creative. It can it can make sure it can make it can keep you from having the bloat. I mean, if you think about, I sometimes think about organizations like Coca Cola, where they have like a million websites and a million pages, and they write a million things, and it must just be exhausting to work there. Like, I can't even imagine trying to get my mind around all of that. But when I think about like, you know, there's there's great organization called Do Something that Word that gets teenagers. Um, participating in activism projects. And you can have like one project. It can be one project about cyberbullying or recycling bottles or whatever. And because they can't do everything in the world, you can get really excited about the thing that works. You can get really excited about the thing that does um, pay off and move your organization forward. Um, constraints make content strategy and priorities a necessity. That's all I have. 
I raised my slides. But I, I did save um, a few minutes for questions. Just talking more than half an hour, but I'm happy to answer questions. Yes. So um, you presented earlier, know your audience and know what they want. I wonder if you have any tips for us on learning what they want. Yes, um, I love surveys. My favorite survey tool in the whole wide world. Survey monkey? No, actually. Um, I honestly cannot tell you what it costs. I don't know how much it costs. Um, Wufu, and I don't know if they have a nonprofit rate, but W U F O O. Um, I like it a lot better than Survey Monkey. It's a really easy tool. Um, I really believe in going directly to customers, so both um, surveys as well as um, interviews. Um, I take interviews with a grain of salt. Again, I really try not to conflate comments with data. Um, but if I ask enough, you know, it, it, it can be a good place to, to get questions that you want to test with the survey. So, um, for example, and I also recommend not, not asking anything you won't use because people's time is valuable. So if you feel like you need to ask demographic information, like why, Are you, do you care? What state they're from, or I mean, if if you do, if that's useful to you, then ask. But but really, don't ask anything you won't use. Um, keep your surveys as short as possible. Um, when you ask people to take surveys, um, be uh, be really transparent. So so say like like we want to make sure that next year's program is better than this year's program. You know, give them something that is in it for them. That's not like, please help us by taking this five minute survey. Because that's, again, about you. But tell them what they'll get out of it. Like, like you have a voice in this. Or you can, you can help us shape the next three years of whatever. Um, and, and tell them how long you expect it to take. If it's three minutes, um, say it's three minutes. If it's 20 minutes, don't send it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but I really, I, I find surveys really useful because again, you can, you can quantify. I do, um, I always try to balance surveys with other data. So for example, um, if, if I hear in a survey that lots of people tell me that they want me to publish a certain kind of resource, like you should publish more things for, uh, you know, downtown, mayors, I don't know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be diverse in my examples, but let's say like, you know, small town mayors need more resources. You don't, you don't have enough for that. Um, and, and if I already have resources for small town mayors and nobody's been buying it or paying for it, I've got a disconnect. So, so I do often, when I do surveys, I let people do it anonymously, but I include an optional like, would you like to be contacted? Because sometimes those comments, I can say like, hey, we actually have these things for small town marriage. You can you can circle back and say, you know, are they not finding it? Do they not like it? Um, is it is it really just one of those comments that you can write off? But I, I I I like to do both. I like to have the survey like what they say, what they tell me, but also some evidence of what they do. So never never using one or the other, but actually both together. Do you ever survey with pop-ups on the website, or I, I worry about that distracting from what the person is actually visiting the website for, but at the same time, if you want to get the users. Yeah, I don't, I don't have, I don't know, like, definitive research data on that. I know that I hate pop-ups, and I, never, I have never in my life answered a pop-up survey. So, um, anything that annoys or gets in the way of what someone's trying to do online is generally inadvisable. Um, it's, I mean, I, I can't say for certain, I mean, I don't have data from places that have done it successfully. I don't know what the return is, but, but the other, I mean, I guess the other warning I would have about doing something like that is, who's taking that survey? Are you really getting a cross-section of who you want? Or are you getting this weird sort of motivated subsection of people who, you know, like, I always think about, you know, when you get survey results, like if, if you send out a million surveys and you get 20 back, you don't really have good data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so if you, if you don't, so, so I think of something like that, well, how many visits did you get to the site and how many people actually took the survey and then how do you know who those people were? Um, 
generally speaking, I would say that's not the best way to collect data. But I, I say that also, you know, knowing that I don't, I don't have any research in my mind that I can point to one way or the other. I just know whenever pop-ups come up, I just do control alt delete and close out the whole browser because I am yeah. nervous about pop-ups. So I just like eh, done, and then I usually don't ever go back to that site if I can help it. You know, so it's just. Yeah. You know, I know I'm only one person that one, yeah. you know. <laughs> I mean, I do but, know that people don't yeah. like them. That's, yeah. That I do know. Um, um, but in terms of whether you collect useful information, I can't say. Yeah. There's like, a, there's very good data from people getting great subscription rates and positive actions out of pop-ups for things that aren't surveys. Sure, So sure. that's why I wonder if it is a feasible thing because subscription rates increase significantly with pop-ups. Yeah, and I guess I would say in that case, I mean, a subscription has a value to the reader. A subscription is like, you're giving me something I might want. Like, yes, I would. I do want updates. I do want information. I do want resources. So, um, I mean, if you have a survey that has a prize attached, you know, if you have something else that's motivating, um, then, then maybe it would work. But, but I think a pop-up should really only interrupt somebody's experience if it improves it, not if it distracts from it. Yeah. When my, I guess I would look at to whether or not what the fallout rates are in those subscriptions. If you're getting the people who don't re realize that they can click X and not put their email address and they think, oh, I have to put my email address to look at this website. There's a whole, you know, there's a subset of internet users who are savvy enough to get there and like, okay, I'll put my email address, but don't realize, oh, I could have just clicked X or they'll accept immediately what's presented, but then once they get the first email, they'll, you know, they might have subscribed, but then they don't want the information, and then they'll unsubscribe or never open the email again. Yeah. yeah. How do you think about um, the content for your website working together with your media, uh, social media uh, content? Um, I really try to think about um, the, Again, what, what are the user's tasks? So that social media might be, um, you know, people aren't, aren't usually searching social media to find an answer, but it's more of a browsing. Um, so, so in that case, I might be trying to pique their curiosity. I might be trying to um, spark sort of initial interest or sharing, something that's really um, shareable and interesting that people would want to disperse. On a website, I mean, most of the time when people go to the website for any organization, it's because they, they, they know what they want. They are going there because they want your phone number. They're going there because um, they heard you have resources that they need. They're going there because you're putting on an event and they want to know what day it is. Um, you know, so, so on a website, I would really focus on the tasks and let helping people get things done, whether that's you know, view the calendar or um, find out how to sign up for a program or what, whatever the tasks are, but they want to get it done. Where on social media, I think you have an opportunity to sort of showcase what you're like a little more and um, and sort of hook people in with, with different things. Thank you. I've heard the uh, social media should be made because of the two-way media, you should bring in more, bring more conversation. For sure, and I would I would definitely share more. You know, if you have um, blog posts, but even if you have um, opportunities or subsections within your website that you can link to, so that you can say like, "Hey, we're having an event," or "We're having," you know, that you can you can point people to specific opportunities that um, you know you may not necessarily want to put your new board of directors, but that's. A news item, you know, that a news item can sometimes be of interest, especially people who are following you on social media already like you. You know, it's not, it's not. Um, those are the people who can tell others about you. So give them something to say. Give them a story to tell. Give them um, an opportunity to share. It's it's less about sort of meeting these task-based needs, and it's more about um, helping people want to spread the word about the work that you do. I wonder if we get this. I will give this to Carrie and yeah. she can send it out to you. Well, I already have given it to you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I should have said that at the beginning. <laughs>
No worries. I guess we have a situation where we're getting kind of different people in house, but also outside the organization, right? Guest blog posts and things like that. Do you have any suggestions for ways to streamline or organize that so that you know, when we don't get a blog post from someone outside right. the organization, like what are backup plans and things like that? I know this one because I have guest blog posts and they just never happen. Uh, I really, I really, um, I love editorial calendars. I do not rely on other people to keep my editorial calendar going. So um, I really recommend having balancing your combination of what you do and don't control so that um, maybe every three weeks you have a guest blog post if you're doing it weekly or you know so, so that if you if something falls through or doesn't happen. Um, the other thing um, I recommend and I don't know how time sensitive your posts are, but I asked three different people to write a blog post at the same time. And, or six or twenty or how, whatever whatever rate of return you're having, I will um, I will ask lots of people and then you know the worst thing that happens is they both give it to you on the same day and say oh you know what I'm sorry I have another post that came in and I'm running yours next week and they don't care generally so I just I just try to keep as much of the control in my court as I can but plan for the things that I can't control. I have a question. Yeah. Which do you think is better, newsletters or blog posts or blogs? It depends on your um, goals and how many people know about you. Um, I I like newsletters. Newsletters are good for the people <coughs> who already know about you. So if you yeah. want those people coming back or knowing what you're doing or staying involved or getting more involved, mm -hmm. newsletters are a great tool for that. <coughs> for people who've never heard of you, a blog post, especially writing a blog post that is not um, is not just about you, but it's something valuable. So that if um, if it's like ways to save money this Christmas, or ways to you know, some, but but it has it still needs to be related to the work that you're doing. But but if it's something that is like oh like that's that's great, then someone will post it on Facebook or send it to someone. Something that's Blog, blogs are good when you're trying to get attention from people who don't know who you are. Okay. Cool. Oh, sorry. Um, you um, were talking about editorial calendars, and uh -huh. I was just kind of wondering if you have any specific tools that you use for that. Um, like we just have an Excel spreadsheet. Um, yep. Yeah, I know that there are fancier tools. Um, we did, we used a Basecamp calendar for a while, and it just didn't give us enough detail. Um, <laughs> I also, my editorial calendar, I have it by date, and then I have it by activity. So um, so I include, like, when I know I want to make social media push, when I know I have something that needs to go to newsletter, when I need to send out an email announcing, you know, the deadline for something, um, call for speakers, or what, you know, I, I will, and then my email I break into audiences, so, so I have a different column for each, because, the way that our email works, there are some people who fall into more than one category, and I don't want to be sending them two or three emails at a time. Mm -hmm. So I just I just really try to map out all the activities and the dates um, in one place. Okay. And we've kind of just started doing editorial calendars, uh -huh. and um, seems like like every department has kind of been like, oh yeah, we need one of those. So now we kind of have like a bajillion, right? right? <laughs> so then it's kind of like, I had to have like a bunch of shortcuts in a folder on my desktop that I need to be like, okay, well, what is, what's going on today? And I have to look at like 10 different files. Right. Um, but I don't know, so do you have any tips for managing like multiple department? Um, um, we just use a shared document. I mean, we have, we use Box, we just use Dropbox. We sort of almost use Google Drive. So I think if yeah, you can have a shared location okay. and you can have, um, either a document that lots of people can update, mm -hmm. or if people are giving updates to one person who makes the updates, that can sometimes be a, a cleaner a cleaner document. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, sometimes there are good reasons to have separate calendars, sure. So, but I think people's default will always be to do their own thing. So the more you can um, figure out where the inefficiencies are and figure out where the overlap outweighs the need for independence. <coughs> Thank you so much.
Make sure that you fill out the evaluation form. And uh, we also have information about some of our upcoming programs, which, you know, if you're working in the content side of things, which is the best you are, uh, we actually have a great one coming up all about user generated content and really you know, making best use of all the tools who are pretty convenient for you. So you definitely want to check that out. All right, thanks so much for coming, everybody. Oh, and one yeah, last thing. Sorry, I, I didn't want to be all ahead. So, but we are having um, a conference for nonprofits in Chicago. In June, and it's about half price of most conference or conferences. And I gave you a discount code on the packet too, so if you get a little friendly. Benefit. So that's that's my high pressure. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you want to get in touch with me or follow Brain Traffic for Confab, um, here's where you'll find us. And, and that will be included too. Yep, yes. this will be in the. Yes. And then I'll be like, definitely. Great. Thank you.